Welcome to another discussion between Yaron Brook and a European intellectual. Today, it's more of a game among friends. So this time it's not a leftist. This time it's a classical liberal. And we have with us Imon Butler. Imon is the director of the Adam Smith Institute. It's perhaps one of the most historical, classical liberal think tanks in Europe and definitely in the UK. So Imon has written a lot of books. Uh, I have here with me the one that I've read, which is Classical Liberalism, a Primer. But also recently he has written something on Ayn Rand. So he's someone who knows Ayn Rand. And his two latest books, one on capitalism and another one on democracy. And I might be missing some. So you should go to the Adam Smith Institute and check out his books there. So the topic today is Adam Smith or Ayn Rand. And what do we mean by this? Who is the philosopher who is in a better position to give us the tools and the ammunition to defend freedom and capitalism? So Yaron knows a lot of things about classical liberalism and Imo knows a lot of things about Ayn Rand. So it should be an interesting discussion. Now, the audience, you can participate in this discussion by sending it to a super chat. Raz is going to collect the super chats and we're going to ask our speakers questions. A huge thank you once more to the Ayn Rand Institute for supporting this series of debates. We hope you enjoy them. Uh, and without any other delay, you already know the format, 10 minutes introduction by Yaron's sparring partner today by Imon, then Yaron replies, then we have a free flowing discussion and then we go to Supersat. So Imon, thanks so much for being with us. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, of course, I, I don't look at it as being Smith versus Rand. I think you need both. I think Rand does a fantastic job of bringing lots and lots of people into the uh, sort of liberal with a small L in the European sense uh, movement. Um, and, uh, but I still think that, that um, uh, in terms of philosophy that uh, Adam Smith uh, is the better philosopher. Um, they agree, of course, on free markets, on free trade, on limited government, um, on all of these good things, um, but they differ on, on many things. Um, methodologically, in terms of their method, uh, Rand is definitely a believer in uh, a priori statements and uh, the power of reason, uh, and she uh, believes in, in rights very strongly. Uh, Smith is, takes a more empirical approach. He asks what works. Um, and his side, he has an idea that humans are naturally moral, that they're social creatures and they work together quite easily. Um, he is not convinced by the rights uh, uh, concept because uh, we don't really know what the natural law, what natural rights really are. And, and, and we argue uh, between each other about what they might be. He also thinks that human reason, uh, which of course Rand puts a, a huge uh, stead on, is, uh, is fallible. Um, and that observation is probably more reliable uh, than trying to abstractly use our minds to, to work out how the world works. And I think that um, all of that is actually in line with how we as human beings do actually think. Uh, we, we, we don't think in sort of rationalist uh, ways. We look at uh, uh, how we live and we look at uh, what works and we look at uh, what doesn't work and we do more of one and less of the other. So in, in terms of method, I think they're quite different. Uh, in terms of uh, their attitudes on rights, which I, I mentioned, uh, Rand is particularly strong on property as a, a natural right. Uh, Smith, of course, does believe in private property very strongly, uh, but he's really in favour of it because uh, overall it uh, delivers better social benefits, that societies with property rights uh, that are well defended seem to do better than those who, who don't. So he asks again, you know, if you want to uh, alleviate misery, um, and uh, generate prosperity, what's the best way? And the answer is indeed uh, property and specialization and exchange. That's got nothing to do with some concept of natural rights. In terms of self-interest, of course, uh, Rand naturally takes rational self-interest as, as her guiding principle. Uh, Smith 
um, accepts the importance of self-interest very strongly, but he also thinks there are other motives that, that, uh, that actually uh, motivate us. Uh, again, we're social creatures. We're moved by the condition of others. It distresses us when we see other people that are in distress. We make sacrifices for our family, for our country, and indeed for our friends. Um, and we do that because we both benefit. Uh, we, we benefit ourselves by doing that. We feel better from doing that, just part of our human nature. And um, other people benefit from, uh, from what we do. It's, it's just, it's like, it's like the market, uh, two sides in a, a transaction and both are, are motivated by self-interest, but both of them actually benefit from the deal. When you get on to capitalism, uh, and Rand, you know, famously was a radical for capitalism, um, I think her version is again about self-interest. And of course she sees altruism as being uh, an outright evil. Uh, Smith, on the other hand, um, thinks that commerce alone is not, capitalism alone, if you like, is not sufficient for a good society. Uh, that again, there are a multiplicity of human motives uh, we have different uh, values, um, uh, you, we value art and culture and lots of other things like that. And uh, market exchange doesn't really uh, do that. that. That is something in addition to, to, um, to market exchange. You, you can't really put a price on a, on, on a, on a work of art. Um, uh, market exchange to uh, Smith is, is not about uh, selfishness, if you like. Um, it's about respecting the other person. Uh, and, and, and we do respect people. And that is one of the reasons why we are altruistic towards them. In terms of government, well, I have to say, um, you know, Rand, of course, was uh, saw government as being limited to protecting rights, particularly property. Um, Smith saw it more about protecting the person from uh, fraud and violence and indeed invasion. Uh, and about providing uh, justice. But he also, um, much to the uh, concern of many of us, uh, favoured a certain number of public works, like bridges, roads and canals, um, provided that they benefited everybody um, and provided that the market didn't actually provide them. Um, and that actually comes at the end of um, The Wealth of Nations, which is a book that took him 15 years to write. And I think by the end of it, his friends were uh, urging him to get on with it and finish. And the, the sections on public works are, are not as well thought out. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I think he sees public works as being uh, necessary as a way to facilitate all of the other things, uh, such, such as commerce. So I think those are the differences. And in terms of uh, what is nearest to how people actually think, um, I think probably Smith is nearer. Thank you, Eamon. So, Yaron. Good. Thank you. And thanks, Eamon, for doing this. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of different to be debating with a friend. <laughs> uh, so I, I appreciate it. Um, I, I think much of what uh, the way Eamon characterizes the differences between Ayn Rand and Adam Smith are, are right. Um, I, of course, believe Ayn Rand is the superior philosopher and Adam Smith may be the superior economist, but, um, but that's where we're going to disagree. It's true. Uh, methodologically, both are very different. Uh, I, I don't quite agree with the way Eamon represents uh, Rand's uh, epistemology, if you will. Uh, I don't think she's a rationalist in a sense of ignoring empirical fact. I think she is an objectivist who takes empirical fact in and uses reason uh, to induce truth from empirical reality. Uh, so she takes what works and what doesn't work uh, is, is, is foundational uh, to, uh, to understanding her, uh, her methodology. Uh, it, it starts with reality, uh, but, but reason plays an important role. A whole ability to conceptualize is to conceptualize off of the facts of uh, morality. I think, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, Smith in a sense does that implicitly, but is advocating for a kind of empiricism that I don't think he, he actually engages in. Um, 
The real difference, the big difference that I think really sets the sets a tone for the for the, all the other differences, is both in method but ultimately in morality. Um, Adam Smith is in uh, in his ethics uh, descriptive in a sense. He's accepting the morality of his day. Uh, he accepts that people are capable of the morality as is common in society at the time, and he is, spends a lot of time on trying to figure out you know, how to practice that morality properly. Uh, Ayn Rand is a revolutionary when it comes to morality. She is challenging our conceptions of morality, our ideas in morality. Uh, right or wrong, she is saying, uh, let's, let's rethink. Why do we need morality? She actually asked the question, what is morality? What, what is morality? What's the purpose of it in human, in, in human affairs? Um, and, and she starts from that point and, uh, you know, develops a theory of uh, rational self-interest, which I think uh, is, is unique and original, um, really on, on certain foundations of Aristotle, but, but very different than Aristotle's as well. Uh, where, uh, for Rand, the conception of morality is a set of values to guide your life towards your survival, your flourishing, your happiness. Uh, those values, some of them relate to other people, which is kind of the, the conventional morality often limits morality just to interchange with other people. Rand expands that to your relationship with yourself. How should you deal with reality? How should you deal with, um, uh, with choices you have to make about your own life independent of other people? Uh, and, and I think in that sense, her conception of morality is, is richer and, and broader than, than most other philosophers. I think here she is real, a really an original thinker. Um, and so for her, everything is about uh, creating the kind of, uh, politically and economically, creating the kind of environment in which individuals can actually live a moral life, can make choices. And for her, of course, morality is about using your mind, using your reason having an opportunity to observe reality, come to conclusions about it, try things, uh, fail, learn from the failure, succeed, uh, thrive, ultimately achieve that happiness. What kind of, in a social setting, what kind of conditions need to hold for an individual to be able to pursue his happiness, to be able to live a good life, to live a flourishing life? And... Uh, and, and, and here, uh, you know, the role of reason, the role of thinking and the role of action is really, really important to her. And she says, what is it that limits our ability to think? What is it that limits our ability to act? And what limits it is coercion. What limits it is force. Uh, what limits is it is an authority with, with, uh, with the ability to impose their views and, and uh, their system on us. And, um, and that's where she gets the concept of rights from. So different than the Enlightenment, which sees it as kind of a natural right, it's somehow embedded in who we are as people. Rand derives it from her morality. It's a consequence of moral people living together, trying to figure out how to interact with one another. Uh, the thing that you want to ban from such a society is force. And the concept of rights articulates that. The concept of rights for her is a, it's a moral concept it brings morality to the social setting and basically argues that individuals are free to act based on their own mind, based on their own values in pursuit of their own ideals. Um, so rights are what, are what separate us, make it possible for us to live in a society and have an agreed upon in a set, set of rules. You can't use force against one another. And government's job is to protect those rights. It's to make sure that that indeed happens. It's to provide an objective system of law and an objective system of enforcement to a situation where people are acting freely um, and, and they're, where they're, the only thing they're really banned from doing is interfering with one another through force and fraud. So the role of government is to protect us uh, from force and fraud. Uh, from foreign invasion, from from I think many of the things that that Eamon articulated, uh, and and nothing else. Uh, and um, capitalism is, in a sense, from an economic perspective, uh, she called capitalism 
a political, social, economic system. So for her, capitalism is a system that captures this view of government. Uh, I think most people think of capitalism as, a, as an economic system, but as an economic system, it is the economic system that arises when you leave people free and where you protect property rights. Property rights for Rand, of course, derive from the idea of, uh, of the right to life, the right to pursue your values, uh, the right to pursue your values free of coercion. Part of the pursuit of life is the ability to retain the property one produces, the property one earns, the property one creates. Uh, so it's it's uh, it, in pursuit of life. So she identifies the fact that as living creatures, uh, we don't just get stuff. You know, it doesn't fall from manna from heaven. Uh, we don't just pick stuff off the ground. We actually have to create the stuff that makes it possible for us to live and to thrive and to, and to, and to, to succeed in life. And once we create it, it is ours. We, we, have, uh, we have gained a right to it. Um, because of that act of creation, it is it is a it is a a part of that right to life. So is you know free speech and and uh, the right to liberty and the right to pursuit of happiness in a sense are all applications of this one right, uh, which is the right to life. Um, Rand, of course, is not against helping others or being charitable. Um, she is, and she's not against spiritual values. Uh, you know, I agree completely about the value of art. Certainly, the value of art to me is not measurable in dollars and cents. So, you know, standing in front of Michelangelo's David, I can't put a number on it, right? It's it's just a it's a it's a it's a truly deep and inspiring um uh, experience. And uh, and Rand would not question that she doesn't believe that all interaction is market interaction, that all interaction is commerce. Um one uh, one trades and one e engages in uh, spiritual trade with others that is not denominated in dollars, friendship, love, uh, are all in a sense trades, but but not trades that 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 you know are commerce are, are thought of in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of dollars. Uh, she views human beings as not just, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, commerce engaged in commerce, but but as complete human beings with a with a spiritual element to them, spiritual in the secular sense. And, and of course she, she had a whole theory of aesthetics. So she, she had a, a, a deep love of the arts and, and a deep appreciation of it. Of course she was a novelist. Um, so, and of course, uh, when it comes to capitalism, Rand was, as, as Eamon mentioned, and was, Rand was the, the, the pure, the, you know, a, a, a purist in a sense of government is there to protect individual rights and other than that, stay out. I think Smith was much more um, accepting of the idea of, uh, we can call it market failure or market not doing certain things that were valuable to society and therefore willing to act. And that goes to the fact that Smith is more concerned with society and wealth creation and society. Rand is more concerned with the individual and the individual's ability to pursue his own happiness, to pursue his own values and that, that society, society in a sense, is the thing we have to protect the individual in society is, is his ability to pursue those. So she's, uh, she's less interested in the social outcome of capitalism and more interested in the, in the capitalism's impact on the individual and in, in the freedom it gives him uh, to pursue his values. So uh, I, 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 think that, I think that Rand in the end uh, while certainly less uh, significantly less influential than than M. Smith, I mean M. Smith had an almost immediate impact on his culture, um, and uh, and and is one of the most influential thinkers uh, in the in a hundred years following his death um, during his life. But then uh, following his death, I mean it, his ideas were put into 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 law, into 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 political. Um, Effect and uh, influences the thinking of uh, professional economists and and uh, and uh, thinkers to this day. Uh, I still suspect that Rand, um, two hundred years from now, will be the one who has the greater influence. Thank you, Yaron. So before we go to the questions from the audience that are already in and the super chats. Uh, so I'm going to ask a question to both of you on one part that, let's say, Ayn Rand and Adam Smith are, let's say, open to criticism. So 
Eman, I'll start, I'll start with you. So what about the argument that says that when you support freedom on utilitarian grounds, on what works, you find yourself in a situation where different people have completely different understanding of what means, quote, what works. And we see this, for example, these days with the lockdown. Some people say, look, we need to meet somewhere in the middle. You have rights, but also you have responsibilities. So we need to find something that works for everyone or something like that. So could we say that this approach by Smith is responsible for the gradual erosion of liberties that we see in the Western world and the fact that it's very difficult to fight against these ideas? No. Uh, the, uh, the, the opposite is also true, that uh, uh, in terms of defining rights, it's by no means clear what human rights, individual rights actually are. Philosophers over the centuries have tried to, to work it out, uh, but uh, you know, there's no definite answer to it. So there's just as much uh, a freedom of play there uh, as there is in, in, in what you're saying. Um, you know, do I have the right uh, to um, call people by um, racially offensive names? Some free speech opponents say that I do, and uh, many others say that I don't. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I have a right over my property, but uh, does that extend to stopping airplanes at 30,000 feet flying across it? Well, these are things that we just have to actually work out as a society. And what Smith says is we do indeed work these things out as a society. Um, and and we, we look at uh, what's practical and we look, look at what work, uh, works and that's what we go on. And generally speaking, we can agree on, on most things that, that work, and yes, there, there's a constant debate uh, on the on the other things where we're not sure. Yaron, a comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I, I think that it is problematic. I, I, while I think uh, applying rights suddenly can be complicated, as as Eamon mentioned, uh, you know, it's not self-evident how you apply rights in every situation. I think rights give us clear, unequivocal guidance, uh, you know, in what direction to work them out and how to work them out. Certainly, racially offensive speech is not violating anybody's rights because force is not engaged. Coercion is not engaged. Now, yes, there are disputes today, but I think the fundamental dispute among philosophers and among thinkers today around rights is about what rights are. That is about the very definition of rights, particularly over the last, since Smith's day, rights have been undermined uh, and um, and uh, suddenly the left has uh, has uh, taken upon themselves to broaden the concept to apply to everything so one needs a clear conception of what individual rights are but one once one has one uh, they provide very clear guidance and I do think that what's good for society as a standard is a is a very is um, is a very slippery slope uh, who gets to decide? How does one decide? What is the mechanism? Is it democratic? It, does the majority get to impose their will on the minority? In democracies, yes. But is that right? The whole idea of uh, the whole idea of of individual rights is to protect us from the majority. It's to protect the individual from what the majority sometimes uh, would like to impose on them. Uh, and majorities, as we know, living in in uh, uh, democracies are, uh, are often, if not most of the time, wrong. So um, it, it, it's it's without individual rights, I don't think one, without a conception or without a defense of individual rights, I don't think one can protect what is crucial, which is the individual's life. Uh, and I think the world as we see it today, uh, as we have it today, where rights are being violated, where we're moving away or have moved away uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. Farm freedom and capitalism are, are direct consequence of taking kind of a a, um, a what's in society's best interest perspective rather than a rights perspective. Right. And now uh, the let's say difficult question for Yaron, and then Eamon can also comment on this. So, what about the argument that look, let's say we take a young person from the university. They've been bombarded with ideas that capitalism impoverishes. Capitalism is bad, capitalism is immoral. Isn't it a smoother tra transition to start with something like the economic argument, to start with the classical liberal argument saying, look, 
we all agree that human beings have rights. We all agree that we want the poor to get richer. And capitalism is good when it comes to that. So could we say then that classical liberalism has been more successful, let's say, than objectivism because it's more easily, let's say, digestible to someone who comes for the first time into contact with these ideas? Yeah, there's no question it's more digestible. Uh, it, it, it's less challenging in a sense that it, 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 it's not challenging the, the, the fundamental core beliefs for example, in morality, where you're not you're not uh, starting them off with something that is uh, that is uh, challenging, uh, let's say the, the the religious beliefs maybe, or the secular beliefs about a moral code that is pretty much accepted universally, except by objectivists. I mean, we really are the tiniest minorities here, but I don't think it can produce lasting results, uh, and I've spoken about this often. I think that ultimately. The, the conventional morality that we live in is incompatible with capitalism. I think as Adam Smith correctly observed, capitalism or free, uh, free markets are driven by self-interested individuals. They're driven by the motive of self-interest, the, the baker bakes the bread and so on, right? Uh, ultimately, people act uh, in commerce at least for their own self-interest. That is hard to um, line up with a morality that says self-interest is, uh, is tainted, um, which, which is the conventional morality. Uh, and as a consequence, that creates cognitive dissonance, which I think long term, over time, uh, erodes people's beliefs in capitalism and ultimately leads them to uh, uh, statist views because, hey, we can't trust those businessmen. We need to regulate them. Hey, we can't trust that charity will take care of, of, of people who really can't take care of themselves, so we need a welfare state. Uh, but, but the focus on the other uh, leads them away from capitalism. And I think that ultimately, we have to challenge their most fundamental beliefs. We have to challenge their beliefs regarding uh, morality. And as I said, I, I, think, I think capitalism is, very, uh, is impossible to defend ultimately without a proper conception of individual rights. Uh, so again, that's it's a challenge. That's not easy. So objectivism is much, much harder, but I also think necessary ultimately. So Eamon, are, is it then that not throwing the morality in the mix is a competitive advantage because it makes our life as, let's say, advocates, as activists easier? Or is it what Yaron says that in the long term, we're going to be punished by that mm. in terms of losing the battle of ideas? Yes. Well, in terms of the battle of ideas, um, you know, you, 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 you began the question with uh, talking about young people who are maybe at college and getting all this bad stuff. Well, in terms of getting those, yeah, I admit, you know, Rand is streets ahead, right? Rand is much more enjoyable to read than The Wealth of Nations, let's say. And it's certainly more enjoyable to read than The Theory of Moral Sentiments. There's no question about that. And so Rand does a, 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 an absolute sterling service in terms of bringing thousands and thousands of young people into the ideas of uh, personal and uh, economic freedom. So yeah, she wins on that score. I think, the, the, I think though that, that um, Smith wins in terms of actually describing how we as human beings act, do actually think. Um, you know, people say that, well, he, uh, Smith is a, um, a philosopher or that, that he's an economist. He's really a social psychologist. You know, he, he wrote about economics, he wrote about uh, philosophy, but at the same time, he wrote about politics and he wrote about uh, aesthetics uh, and uh, rhetoric and other things like that. And he was really trying to work out how the human mind actually works. And I think you've got to sort of understand how the human mind works before you can then go on and say, well, how should we actually then behave? You've got to understand what the, the pressures are on us and, and why we come to certain decisions that, that we do. Um, many of the, the difficulties that I think uh, Yaron has, has been describing, I, I do agree, are, uh, are problems of, uh, of democracy. Um, democracy in the sense that, well, the majority rule. And that's not what the original you know, founders of the American Republic or indeed the, uh, the Roman Republic uh, had in mind. They, they did indeed think 
that a majority voting was good for a few things uh, that you couldn't decide in any other way. Um, but that certain rights, yes, came first. There's no question about that. And I think the 18th century thinkers like Smith would, would say exactly the same. Um, but, uh, you know, you're talking about rights that are pretty obvious and, and, and that there's very little dispute about. And as Rand says, um, uh, rights are basically a political expression of uh, a moral uh, concept. And people do disagree about morality, and therefore they disagree about rights. You know, they may think, well, you know, we've got a right to, to live without being arbitrarily killed because of our views, for example. Uh, but uh, there are many, many different things that they don't really agree, uh, agree on. And, and, and they don't necessarily uh, uh, agree that somebody isn't being harmed just because they're being called by a racist name. You know, when I was in America and Yaron's countrymen, uh, called me a limey, I was you know, rather, <laughs> rather hurt and I, I still remember it. Now, is that, a, is, is that an actual harm? And should we be responding to that by saying, no, you shouldn't do that, that, that you have no right to, 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 to use these, this language? Well, you know, that's where you get to, but it's, it's a moral discussion. Thank you, Eamon. So let's go to the super chats now. So first of all, Jonathan uh, raises a glass a super chat glass in uh, appreciation of Yaron and CJ congratulates Yaron for his uh, recent debate with Vos and he uses a term for Vos that I won't uh, pass on the air but it's not very pleasant so and let's go now to questions thanks CJ and thanks uh, Jonathan for your super chat so super chat questions so Christopher asks what is Adam Smith's notion of the good and I would add then Yaron can tell us how this relates to Rand's notion of the good. So what is Smith's notion of the good? Well, um, he thinks that we're created um, in such a way that um, we uh, derive, uh, I suppose, enjoyment, you might say, by um, the, the good of others, that, that we feel sympathy, uh, as he called it, or empathy, as we would call it, uh, to others. So I think being aware of others he would regard as being extremely important um, and uh, he would say that uh, in our minds there is what he calls an impartial spectator who is somebody sort of outside our bodies that's that's looking into us and saying well uh, you know when you did that were you really trying to help the other person um, or were you just doing it for your own satisfaction or were you doing it for some other um, bad motive uh, and it just happened to do the other person some good. So um, he, he's very strong about on, on conscience and that we should be following our conscience because uh, that has been put in us by our creator, who is, you know, either God uh, or, or nature. Um, Smith was very, very squishy on the idea of, of God. He talks mostly about providence and mostly about uh, nature and so on rather than God. But anyway, uh, how we're created um, and th and that's, uh, that, that leads us in the right direction. And uh, that means that we've got to be self-critical. Um, and he sees the virtues as being prudence, but also justice um, and beneficence, uh, you know, being uh, kind to others. Uh, and, and those really are his concept of, of the good person and uh, uh, the good society and uh, the, the good virtues. Thank you. Yaron, what is the good for Ayn Rand? And how so does it relate to what Iman just... I mean, the good for Ayn Rand is that which promotes human life. So that which promotes life, uh, the one's... Uh, capacity to survive, to live, and, and ultimately to thrive and, and to be happy. So, uh, and, and then it is an empirical question. Okay, what promotes the good? What is good for human beings as individuals to engage in, in order to, to thrive? Um, and so for her, that's where, you know, reason plays a, a central part for her to be rational, to think is fundamentally how we gain values in the world. That is, uh, again, we're not programmed to be successful uh, in the world out there. We're not programmed 
to know how to do uh, agriculture, to do um, uh, hunting or, or to produce an iPhone. All these things have to be figured out. And, and she places a central role on uh, for human beings to survive, for human beings to think, to use their mind, to reason. Um, and uh, and to be able to act based on that reason to, to into uh, to pursue the values that they discover are crucial to their own uh, to their own life and to their own happiness. Her focus is is very much on the individual in that sense. Um, she thinks a society of individualists seeking their own happiness, pursuing um, thinking through problems, trying to solve problems, who are not using force and fraud on one another. Uh, is is a thriving, successful society. And that's the kind of society that she believes capitalism uh, and, and the protection of individual rights, as, as difficult as they might be sometimes to define and apply, is uh, it, it achieves. That, that kind of society is what it achieves. And again, the, 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 um, the fact that there are disagreements about these things doesn't mean there's no right and wrong answer. Uh, the, you know, mostly we get wrong answers these days, but there are right answers, and that's that's a debate. So Rand, again, is more the revolutionary. Rand wants to educate people about these ideas, and uh, and to to change their minds and to convince them that they've got that they are thinking about them in a wrong way. That, for example, their conception of free speech maybe is wrong. That even though Amon justifiably was offended. Uh, by being uh, by being called a bad name, um, that is not a violation of rights. That rights actually need to 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 involve um, either fraud or an act of violence against him. And and uh, uh, hurting his emotions, uh, hurting his feelings is not an act of violence. Um, but that's that's that needs to be you know one has to convince that that's not there's no. Uh, Rand is very much that um, we're not born with these ideas. They're not just there. They're not. They're not categorical imperatives in my mind to just be discovered. We have to engage in reason and discussion and in, in, in empirical observation to discover truth and then to convince other people of those truths. Uh, can I? Can I? Uh, you're on. I, I, I mean, uh, okay. Morality is about promoting life. Well, don't you think that Smith though? thinks very much the same thing, that, that he's saying that morality is about um, a social system, which uh, he didn't understand uh, um, e evolution, so he put it down to providence, sure. uh, but uh, it's, it's a social system which actually helps us to survive. And uh, he says very plainly that um, if we didn't have these values and this morality, uh, then we'd be dead. Uh, so, uh, so you know, Smith is quite similar to, to Rand on that. And also, um, it seems to me that it's by no means clear what, what promotes life. It's, it's a very distant goal that Rand uh, sets herself. And, and, and there are many stages on the way where you can, you can slip up. So I'm not entirely convinced about uh, life as being, being a, a standard. I think it's too difficult a concept. We just don't know how it works. So I think the difference is that Smith's, that, that morality, broadly speaking, conventional morality, I think is very limited in that it's primarily focused on interaction with other people, uh, primarily focused on our relationship with other people. Now that's important. There's no, and, and Rand doesn't reject the importance of interaction with other people. Um, and, and she views it through the lens of justice and treating people the way they deserve. Uh, I don't think there's any lack of empathy in a sense in Rand. It's just a question of why somebody is in the situation there is. I, I mean, it, it's, it's somewhat shocking to reread Atlas Shrugged and, and see all the, all the places in which Dagny, the self-interested businesswoman, you know, is, is kind and pleasant to, to bums, right? To, to people who are, who, are, who are riding on a train for free and who are in a sense stealing and just didn't have a meal with them to discuss because she's trying to understand and she has empathy given the situation in the world. Why are you in the condition? What happened? Why, why is a human being uh, in this position? But if she comes to the conclusion that it's your fault, <laughs> that is you did something wrong and therefore you're in this condition, then justice would demand one attitude and, and a different. And I don't know that they disagree about that if they sat down at Smith and her about how you evaluate particular individuals. 
But I think morality is much richer for Rand in the sense that it, it, it's not self-evident what life demands. So I agree with you, Eamon. It's not self-evident what life as the standard means. This is why we need philosophers. This is why you need somebody like Ayn Rand and, and other philosophers. And, and we could argue about, and, and, and I'm open to the argument, okay, she got this virtue wrong, or there should be this other virtue or whatever. But I think she got the standard right. And now the question is, how we figure out what the different virtues are to reach that standard. And, and, and that's where I think that's where the debate would be, right? So she had the sta same standard, I think, as Aristotle or similar standards as Aristotle, but they disagree about the virtues. They don't have the same virtues. And I think we can have those debates and those discussions at that level once we accept if the individual life is the standard and that's what we're focused on. Now let's debate what are the virtues that lead to that I think I think is crucial. I, you know, from my understanding, and you know, I I I've, I think she's right about those virtues. But I'm open to the idea that there might be more, there might be less, there there might be something she's missed, or there might be something wrong there. But I I I like I, I want to live in a place where that's the debate, that's the discussion, because I think we've moved a lot further. Uh, and and what role does social interaction play in that bigger picture, which I, again, I don't think she denies, but again, some people might think it's a bigger role than what, what Rand thought or a smaller role. Those are the kind of debates that I think are interesting. Okay, let's go to some more questions from the audience. Uh, Marilyn says a worthy opponent of Amen. So thank you, Marilyn. And question from Super K Peel. So it would be impossible to have a discussion on Adam Smith and the invisible hand not to come up. So. Did Ayn Rand agree with the invisible hand idea? And Eamon, if you want to tell us a bit what the invisible hand is, because many people are getting it uh, wrong. Yes, well, actually, people who are experts on Adam Smith don't necessarily get it right either. It's a very difficult concept. And it's a, it's a phrase which he mentions only, uh, I think, three times uh, in all of his books. And it's, it's a pretty oblique thing. But, but I think the general concept is this, uh, that uh, we all pursue our self-interest, uh, but in pursuing our self-interest, we actually create uh, general benefit for humankind. Um, when we go uh, into the marketplace, uh, we go there intending to benefit ourselves by buying things that we need. But then we give our money to the tradespeople uh, who um, consider themselves to be better off as a result. So we both benefit from the, the exchange. And when this happens over the whole society, then it's as if, says Smith, there's an invisible hand that's pushing us to do the right thing, create a good society and, and a flourishing society. So I think, so I think, I, so I think Ayn Rand certainly agrees with the idea behind it. I think what she would argue is that it's not invisible in the sense that she would say, well, of course, if people pursue their self-interest properly, you know, rationally understood, that yes, people are better off. And, and, and she articulates the trader principle. Um, and and that, that it, I think a deeper understanding of what self-interest means and how self-interest works and that self-interest leads us towards engaging in win-win relationship, in, in trader relationship, uh, leads one to, to, to the idea that yes, ev you know, everybody who's participating in the system, everybody's willing to be productive and willing to be a trader is better off as a consequence of this free market. And, and in that sense, that everyone's better off is something that Rand would agree, um, would agree with. And I think it's important also, uh, you know, to um, distinguish between self-interest and greed. Uh, and uh, Smith, of course, and the other 18th century th thinkers of the time made the, the comment that we're all self-interested. We have to be self-interested uh, interested because if we weren't self-interested, we'd be dead. <laughs> we, we wouldn't be doing the things that we yeah. need to do to keep, keep us alive. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, my father was a, a mechanic. He ran a, a small repair shop. Um, if he'd been greedy, if he tried to cheat his customers, um, he wouldn't have any trade because uh, they would tell their friends and uh, that would be the end of that. So uh, there is a big difference between uh, greed and self-interest and we're in favor of self-interest and we're against greed. 
Yeah. Yes. So a couple of things. One is Rand didn't view people as just as, as, as self-interested naturally, although she'd agree that they have to be self-interested in some aspects of their lives. Otherwise, they couldn't survive. The, the self-interest is needed to survive. And if they, But she viewed self-interest, again, as a moral ideal that is something you really have to work at. And, and you have to go beyond just the certain level of self-interest that we all engage in just in order to survive and, 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 and do it consistently across one's life. Um, and with regard to greed, greed itself, I think is a is a um, is one of these concepts that it kind of depends on the definition. But yes, uh, we're all against, and and we all should be against uh, uh, the idea of exploiting other people in order to supposedly achieve our values. And and if, if Gold's Gold's um, uh, oath in Gold's Gulch in in Atlas Shrugged is, of course, I I, I swear not to be, allow myself to be exploited to live for other people, but I also will never expect other people to live for me uh, and exploit other people. So yes, it, 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 for Rand, being honest is being self-interested. Having integrity is being self-interested. So those are part of what it means to be self-interested in a sense of morality. It, it, morality is what allows you to be self-interested. It, it, it is, it's, it's completely integrated into it. So yes, that kind of behavior is, uh, is out. So the win-win behavior is moral behavior and it leads everybody to be better off. And that's, there's a sense in which that is the invisible hand. Okay, another question from Frank. Sorry, first from Jeff. First of all, Jeff, thank you for your kind words. So Jeff is asking, he's trying to read more and he's asking, his question is for Eamon. Do I need to read the theory of moral sentiments before I read Wealth of Nations? So what's the proper order for someone to understand Adam Smith, Damon? Don't read either. They're <laughs> possibly long, they're extremely confused, and they're written in a flowery 18th century language. What you should do is you should read my primer on Adam Smith. It's, it's, uh, it's called uh, The Condensed Wealth of Nations, with the subtitle, and the really condensed a uh, uh, theory of moral sentiments. And I, what I've done there is in a hundred pages where, where Smith takes more than a thousand, um, I, I've summarized his arguments, put in some of his quotes and, and explain some of what he's, what he's trying to say. Um, and uh, I, 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 think, I don't think you, you need to read one before the other or whatever. They're, they're, they're two different parts of the human mind. And uh, there are also, um, he, he never completed, or he, he never even started actually, a, a, a book on politics, which he probably intended to write, uh, because by then he was kind of famous and people were throwing themselves at him and he probably didn't even, didn't even have time. Uh, but um, we have some notes from students uh, who sat through his lectures um, about, about politics. So those are, are very interesting um, uh, as well. Uh, so they're just different parts of the human mind. I, I, I don't know. And I think they go together, actually. I mean, I, I, you know, people talk about, um, it's a sort of German expression, das Adam Smith problem, the Adam Smith problem, uh, that, you know, in one sense, he's saying, oh, you know, we're all self-interested, blah, blah. And in the moral sentiments, he's saying, oh, no, no, we're all uh, motivated by the, the wealth and, and prosperity of others. Well, no, uh, you know, he's, he's saying that these are two different motives within us. We, we are a, a complexity of, of motives. And it's not one single thing. This is, this is I think, probably what I, I'm most concerned about uh, in, in Rand. There's, there's, there's no single thing which uh, drives us and which explains everything. And I, I, I think it's too simplistic. I would say I'm trying to put a link of that book on the super chat, but Amazon says it's run out of stock. It's an, it's not oh, available you, you, anymore. You can get it free from Adam uh, AdamSmith.org. Okay, uh, so Razi, if you can put there. the link uh, on the super chat, that would yeah. be that would be great. Okay, next question. Next question is from Frank. Would Amin? agree that Mandeville was as radical as Rand in his own way and that Adam Smith provided a, an acceptable version of Mandeville. <laughs> Mandeville is great fun. 
uh, I, I do recommend him. Uh, he, he produced this thing called the, the Fable of the Bees. And his argument is the beehive, you know, carried on because all of the bees were pursuing their self-interest. And then suddenly, uh, you know, some head bee uh, decides, no, we've all got to uh, support others and be helpful to others and all that kind of thing. And then the bee society just falls to pieces. And there's a certain amount of, uh, <laughs> amount of truth, truth in that, uh, that uh, society works. And I think, think that Smith would, would think that, yes, yeah, society works because we do actually have the social psychology that we have, that however we came by it, providence or, <clears throat> He didn't know about evolution, but it, but but we do, um, or whether it's God, who knows? Uh, but that's the way that we are built. And uh, if we didn't have that particular uh, ar arrangement of uh, uh, human characteristics, um, then society wouldn't actually work work very well. So I, I don't know that um, I, I wouldn't describe Smith as a sort of apologist for 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 Mandeville. I think Mandeville was. Uh, uh, took an impish fun in, in poking uh, the, the existing institutions. And I think probably Rand had a bit of impish fun doing exactly the same. <laughs> okay, so I will ask the last question unless we have any other last minute question from the audience. So you have both been leading a big uh, organization that support freedom and you've been around and you've seen good days and bad days about the ideas of freedom. So now that we've been 18 months into this adventure, uh, how do you see the future? And are you more confident, less confident? And what did we do wrong without going too deep into it? What did we do wrong and we found ourselves in this position of defense at the moment? Who is we? Western societies or what? what no, we people who appreciate freedom. I don't know that we did anything wrong. Um, uh, the world got messed up very, very quickly because we have too little influence in it. Um, so uh, I, I, I think that's that's the bottom line. I think people, people, particularly politicians, as you'd expect, panicked uh, and resorted to what politicians know best, which is the imposition of force and broad stroked solutions uh, that, uh, and disregard uh, the individual and disregard individual freedom. Uh, no respect for that, no, no real caring for that. Just uh, in, in that sense, it seems like the Chinese model, a, a, a softer, uh, more friendly version of the Chinese model, uh, you know, won the day. Uh, so I'm as always optimistic about the long term um, because I think good ideas and the right ideas win out over time. And I think that... Uh, I think, if anything, the the lockdowns and COVID, an opportunity for us to inspire young people around the right ideas and around ideas of liberty and freedom. I think a lot of people know something went wrong and they don't know exactly what. And I think there's a lot to learn and there's a lot we can talk about as examples uh, from what happened under COVID, uh, both how the market worked in some cases and how the market wasn't allowed to work in other cases, how um, where people's mind and actions were free, uh, we got vaccines and where they weren't allowed to be free, we, you know, we got a lot of repression. Um, so long term, I'm very optimistic, but, but short term, I'm very worried because I think the statists have learned an important lesson. <laughs> and the important lesson is we'll let them get away with almost murder, not quite murder, but close to it, right? They were, you know, we, we live in societies that uh, just folded when the status said we have to lock you down and we have to keep you locked down and keep you locked down and keep you locked down and no standards, no objectivity, no, um, uh, no end game, no solutions. Uh, people just, there was no rebellion. There was, there was no uh, standing up against them or anything like that. So uh, that scares me in terms of what they've learned and what they now think they can get away with, with regard to maybe climate change or with regard to other social ills that they might um, they might conceive of. Yeah, Evan, are you more optimist or less optimist? Uh, Yaron yeah, yeah, and I are both optimists. Uh, in in his case, it's natural. I have to force myself, but I, I'm still I'm still an optimist. I, I think uh, it's interesting. The, the, there's been uh, 
a huge amount over the last uh, couple of years, one of the things which has been very interesting and rather encouraging is the amount of public debate. Uh, the amount of facts and figures and arguments that there are in circulation and people, you know, take different sides and, and all the rest of it. And there's probably no clear right and wrong as to what we should do, shouldn't do. Uh, but uh, we, we, we've had a very good, jolly good uh, worldwide public debate about it. But I think that's, that's good. And I think also uh, the revolution in medicines. I, I think is just going to be just amazing. The mRNA technology is just going, going to um, uh, give us a real step up. Um, you know, Rand, of course, did write about the, the economics of emergencies. And I think emergencies um, are different. You've got to watch it because as uh, F.A. Hayek said, um, uh, an emergency is, is a good excuse uh, for status to uh, pile on more statism uh, and more collectivism. So uh, you've got to, you've got to, to watch it. And the, and the point about an emergency is that it, firstly, it's something that's unexpected and it's unusual. But secondly, it's it's got to start and a finish. You know, an emergency doesn't go on forever. And I think we've probably got an emergency which is going to go on forever because, as as Yaron said, the, the, there's no clear standard as to how you get out of it. Um, and I think that that is partly uh, a problem of our contemporary democracy. I think that democracy has elided into populism. And uh, you know, to some extent, the increase of the franchise, expansion of the franchise, uh, which you know, I'm, I'm in favor of, my, my great aunt was a leading suffragette, uh, I, but, but it's legitimized the political process or, or, or it's legitimized democracy, which means that it's legitimized the political process. So politicians say how wonderful democracy is, forgetting that it's a way of deciding things that you can't actually decide in any other way. And it's not necessarily a great way to decide things you can't decide in any other way. But politicians tell us how wonderful it is and uh, therefore that we should have more of it. So before you know where you are, um, they're legislating about the size of your fizzy drinks uh, can. Um, and so that has gone uh, you know, far too far. But I'm full of optimism, particularly because, um, well, let me pay my tribute to, to Rand again, because uh, the, the minds of young people are fresh and alive and open to new ideas and, and thinkers like, like Rand uh, have opened those minds yet further. Uh, so I'm optimistic, you know, the, 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 old, the old folks, okay, they're, they're into statism, right? They, they're collecting their pensions and, and they love the government because it keeps them uh, fit and healthy and educates their kids for nothing and all the rest of it. Uh, younger people um, know that there's, there's a better world out there and that uh, we as individuals, uh, we can make a difference to that world. And that's something which really needs to be encouraged. Okay, we have two more minutes and two super chats. So I'm going to throw both super chats and you pick whatever you find more important on them. So Avid Comp asks, so basically we need to get straight with the difference between altruism and benevolence because otherwise we underpin a moral bankruptcy. So altruism and benevolence, not the same thing. And, Fab and Fabian asks, had the liberty movement adopted Rand or Smith more? Would it be better off? Which, if so? So this is the question that underpinned the whole discussion. So uh, should the liberty movement adopt more of Rand or more of Smith? And the other question, altruism and benevolence, not the same. If we don't make the difference, we're in trouble. I think uh, Yaron is the man for uh, altruism versus benevolence. I, I wouldn't uh, venture into that my, myself. Uh, but in terms of um, the, the, the liberty movement, um, no, I, th I think it's a matter of mutual respect. I, I think that, uh, that both are important and lots of other uh, uh, liberal thinkers are important. I wrote a book about called 101 Liberal Thinkers. And uh, there's, there's more that I had to, to miss out. It, it's a hugely fertile field of thought. And uh, as I say, there's no right answers and, and people come up with ideas and then a hundred years later, somebody else refutes that. 
uh, and proposes another liberal idea and then that, that carries on and then some, somebody tweaks that another century later. That's how uh, liberal thinking grows and develops and uh, widens and, and deepens. And uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful process to, to watch. It's sometimes a messy process to watch, uh, but it's a very fertile movement. Yaron, parting words on these two questions. Sure. I mean, uh, altruism, as it's a term coined by Augustine Comte, uh, the, the 19th century French philosopher, uh, describes the idea of living for the sake of others. That is, that your own happiness, your own self-interest should not be a factor in your actions. And, and I think Smith has a little bit of that, right? I mean, part of, the, uh, part of his... Um, uh, his objective observer is supposed to supposed to tell you, you know, don't do it. Just, you know, uh, make sure that the motive is the right motive. Uh, Rand would question whether a self-interested motive, uh, Rand would say a self-interested motive is a good motive. It's not a bad motive. But, but that's where the disagreement is. Should one live for others? Should one do stuff for others where oneself doesn't get any benefit? I think benevolence is a, di is a different concept. It is uh, Rand very much viewed other people as a value, and she was benevolent towards them. There was it, other people were uh, productive, uh, had minds. They were they were doing things in life, whether she benefited directly from them or not, uh, or whether we benefit directly from them or not. They are you know benefiting the world in which we live by by being productive and good people, and therefore one sh should treat people well. One should treat people nicely because uh, they're human, they're alive, and life in and of itself is a value. Uh, to a living being. Um, uh, with, you know, with regard to the liberty movement, I'll just say, I, I, I do think that, you know, it, the liberty movement would benefit if they took Rand more seriously. I, I, I wish they did. Uh, uh, Eamon is, is, is an exception in the movement where he has, he disagrees with her, but he's taken her seriously and, and engaged with her ideas and, uh, and uh, deserves a lot of respect for that. And uh, I, I think too few do. Um, and I, I think the movement would benefit enormously from having her, not just her ability to attract young people to the movement, because I think she deals with morality and that's what inspires them, uh, but also to engage with her philosophical ideas and let, let's have the debate out in the open and let's, uh, you know, if good ideas win in the end, the best ideas win in the end, let's, let's hash them out in the open. And I think the Liberty Movement has been more open to that, I'd say over the last 10, 15 years than it has been in the past. So I'm encouraged and I think, and I, I think, and I hope that uh, that uh, debate and that discussion is going to continue, uh, is going to continue into the future. Thank you so much, both. I think it was a good discussion. People enjoyed it. Uh, maybe next week we slightly change the tone because Yaron is debating a leftist on the issue of property rights, good or bad. So the discussion between will be with uh, Professor Matt McManus. Uh, Professor McManus is writing on Jacobin, but he knows also uh, about the history. So it's not someone who, you know, is your typical leftist who has no idea. So it should be an interesting discussion. So a huge thank you to Eamon Butler. And I know I mispronounce your name every time, but I do this with everyone. So you should not be offended with that. And a thank you to, again, check out his work, check out his books, check out the Adam Smith Institute. Hopefully Razi has put the link for his work on there. Again, as I said in the beginning, I've read the classical liberal a primer. I've also used it in class. It's a very good introduction to the ideas of classical liberalism. It's relatively short and good. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Yaron. Thanks to our viewers and thanks to the Ayn Rand Institute for supporting this series. See you next